my name is Brian Anderson. I'm the editor of City Journal. And I'm uh, extremely pleased to welcome back to New York City Anthony Daniels, better known to City Journal readers as Theodore Dalrymple, uh, the Dietrich Weissman Fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Now, Tony was formerly a psychiatrist at a prison and public hospital in Birmingham, England. Uh, but these days, he devotes himself to writing and lives uh, his time basically split between the south of France and England. Now, this autumn, City Journal will be celebrating its 25th anniversary. Tony, <laughs> thank you. T Tony's been a contributing editor at the magazine for 21 years of that quarter century. And this morning we did a count of how many pieces he's written for City Journal over the course of that period, and it, it, it's 350. Wow. Now that's long and short, uh, but that makes him City Journal's most prolific writer in its history. Now what's striking about Tony's work, though, isn't uh, just its abundance, it's, it's astonishing thematic range. Now here's a few themes uh, Tony has explored in recent issues. Uh, the graffiti of Banksy, the dysfunction of Britain's socialized health system, Muslim alienation in France, the inexhaustible richness of Shakespeare's Hamlet, and in our brand new issue, which just arrived from the press today, a chilling story called Into Darkness, which argues that sometimes a victim bears some responsibility for their plight, and that it is an evasion of moral responsibility to pretend that that isn't the case. But whatever the, whatever the subject, Tony writes with insight and expressive power, leading the founding editor of the influential website Arts and Letters Daily to deem him one of the greatest essayists of our age and the George Orwell of our time, and the new criterion's Roger Kimball to call him the Edmund Burke of our age. Small wonder then that when people come to the City Journal website via search engine, Theodore Dalrymple is one of the two names, Heather MacDonald being the other, that most frequently comes up. In addition to his City Journal writing, which has been collected in three books to date, uh, including Not With a Bang But a Whimper, Tony's work, either under his own name or that of his nom de plume, appears regularly in the New Criterion, National Review, The Wall Street Journal, and many, many other publications. He's now the author of upward of 20 books, the latest of which, just out from Encounter, and the subject of his talk today is entitled Admirable Evasions, How Psychology Undermines Morality. It's a brief 120-page provocative exploration of our contemporary cultural condition. So we'll leave some time after Tony speaks for questions, which I will field. Uh, please, though, wait for the mic to arrive uh, say who you are and then ask a question rather than make a long statement of some kind so other people get a chance uh, to ask as well. Uh, the book is also for sale here in the back of the room. Uh, and uh, without further ado, let me turn over the mic and uh, the event to Anthony Daniels. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Brian, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, amongst my accomplishments, I'm afraid public speaking isn't one, but uh, uh, I'm very pleased to be here uh, uh, today. And as Brian told you, uh, it's uh, 21 years since Myron uh, Magnet, who's in the audience, uh, first asked me to write for the City Journal, and I haven't missed an issue since. Um, though for biological reasons, I think uh, this is unlikely to uh, uh, be repeated uh, for another 21 years. Well, when uh, uh, Myron asked me to write for him, um, I was, besides uh, working as a doctor, of course, uh, a journalist working uh, for the British press, uh, than which uh, few activities can be more frivolous. Um, among other things, I was what you might call the vulgarity correspondent of a newspaper of vast circulation whose attitude to vulgarity, shall I say, was ambivalent. 
in theory it was against it, but in practice uh, it promoted it very strongly and it would send me uh, to places where people were behaving very badly to report on them, so naturally I didn't have to go very far. <laughs> I was uh, an occasional foreign correspondent as well for that newspaper, and one day they called me up and asked me whether I could go the following day to Algeria. And um, Algeria at that time was, was having a very, very nasty uh, civil war. It was probably the most dangerous place in the world and everyone was having uh, his throat cut by someone else. And uh, my, uh, my wife overheard the request and absolutely forbade me to go. So I, of course, I, I refused. I said I couldn't. Well, said the man from the newspaper, if you can't go to Algeria, uh, can you go to London Fashion Week? Uh, now, obviously, these two things were roughly equivalent in the mind of the editor of this uh, newspaper. Um, well, of course, I didn't know anything more about fashion than I knew about Algeria, and so I went. And, in fact, I was very glad I did, because I discovered a, a world of whose existence I had no previous suspicion, which made the court of Louis XIV seem like a paradise of sincerity and spontaneity. But I also learned there uh, an unexpected lesson in the endurance of national characteristics. A bus was laid on uh, for the journalists to uh, ferry uh, us to the various shows, which were in different locations. And on, this, on one bus, I sat next to a German uh, fashion photographer, and uh, we started uh, uh, talking. So you are a fashion journalist, she said. No, I said, I, I know absolutely nothing about fashion and have no interest in it whatsoever. And she said, and you are writing an article about it? And I said, yes, you see, that, that's the whole point. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, uh, in Germany, this would not be possible. <laughs> And I said, uh, well, I suppose that explains the success of the German economy. <laughs> anyway, it was a uh, considerable relief to me to be able to write at length in the City Journal about uh, various important uh, subjects, or uh, subjects that seemed to me important, and not necessarily of immediate topicality, and sometimes even merely literary. Um, but nevertheless, I hope that they all had some bearing on contemporary life, because, of course, we're all influenced by things more than what happened yesterday, but uh, sometimes what happened the day before yesterday, and even longer ago than that. Um, so my first article, my first piece in the City Journal was called The Knife Went In, and it referred to a curious uh, phenomenon that I had noticed in the prison in which I worked as a doctor, and that was that virtually all murderers who stabbed someone to death uh, said uh, of the crucial moment, the knife went in. Um, and I thought this was a rather curious way of putting it, uh, implying as it did that the, the knife had a volition of its own and guided the hand uh, that held it. And my wife, uh, who uh, doesn't believe everything I say, uh, thought I was exaggerating, and, um, uh, uh, but she's also a doctor, and one day she had a patient in her clinic, and she asked him about her husband, and she said, uh, the knife went in. And she phoned me up immediately and said, I now believe you. Anyway, I thought this way of putting uh, the matter was uh, significant, because, of course, it meant uh, that the perpetrator, by his rather peculiar locution was distancing himself from his own act and from his own responsibility for it. And he was turning, he was turning his act into a kind of a natural event like the eruption of Vesuvius rather than a motivated uh, willed action with an intention of his own. But in fact, it's uh, not only murderers who use this uh, mental device. Um, I won't actually ask for a show of hands. Uh, but I doubt that there is anyone in this room who has never used it him or herself. And certainly, 
the human mind rarely displays its flexibility so brilliantly as when it is finding excuses for bad behavior or rationalizations for doing uh, what is wanted but not good. And, and even the dullest person uh, who has never had an original idea in his life becomes wonderfully inventive the moment he is justly accused of having done something or has to find reasons for not doing uh, what he knows he ought to do. Now, this is an important and, uh, if not particularly creditable, a fact or aspect of human psychology that I think is available to anybody who will either pay attention to it or think about the words and acts that other people uh, uh, use and uh, pay attention as to what uh, Dr. Johnson uh, referred to as the motions of his own mind. And it's my uh, contention uh, that honest attention to the words and deeds of others and to our own thoughts and emotions reveals to us infinitely more about the human condition uh, than the formal study of uh, psychology has ever done or will ever do. In fact, psychological theory, uh, at least this is my contention, uh, whether it be psychoanalytical, behaviorist, Darwinist, or neurochemical, or whatever school, uh, certainly any theory that claims to explain all or a large portion of human existence actually creates a barrier to human self-understanding rather than an advancement in it, insofar as it encourages people uh, to think uh, both of themselves and of others as objects rather than subjects. And this inevitably leads to an increase in an intellectual and moral dishonesty and evasion. Because try as we might, we cannot evade our, our normal situation of being subjects rather than being mere objects. So we are always subjects to ourselves. Anyways, as I said, this is the thesis of my a uh, new book very kindly uh, published and very cleverly published uh, uh, by Encounter. They managed to get it up to 120 pages. Uh, and of course, I don't want to praise myself, but I think I can say without fear of being accused either of false modesty or of boasting that it is very short. <laughs> so that even if what it says is completely mistaken, I can say in my own defense uh, that I didn't take up much of anybody's time. <laughs> well, let me illustrate the point, not by quoting or referring to the contents of the book, that, um, that uh, I want, of course, people to read the book, and if I quote, that, that will be more or less it. Uh, but rather by uh, referring to the fact that a book was recently sent me through the post by publishers in the hope that I would make some reference to it or even review it. And that in 360 pages sought to prove with an enormous machinery of academic references that human beings on the whole uh, need face-to-face -face and person-to-person -person contact. And they are much happier if they do have such contact. Now imagine uh, going to someone going to Shakespeare and earnestly explaining to him the content of this book. Well, you know, well, William, did you know that human beings need one another to be happy? I bet you didn't, but that's because you grew up in the 16th century, poor chap. <laughs> well, I don't think the bard uh, would be bemused because actually nothing bemused him, uh, but he might have been amused, uh, and two lines of his own might have uh, run through his head. Lord, what fools these mortals be, and O oh, brave new world that has such creatures in it. Now I'm going to embark on a, a procedure which might strike you as a little unfair, but of course, fairness is a bit dull, and in any case, often misses the point. Um, so I'm going to compare a typical modern psychologizing 
uh, with, more, with a slightly more literary type of psychology of an earlier period and leave it to you uh, to decide for yourself which suggests a deeper grasp, indeed a, 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 a more honest attempt to grasp what many have called the human condition, which of course is a slightly vague term, but we can't make words more precise than their subject matters allow. And false precision is as hazardous as imprecision. Well, in the bookstore uh, at the airport on my way to New York, I bought the first two books of psychology that I happened to see. And uh, bear in mind that it is sometimes claimed that uh, uh, humanity has made tremendous advances in self-understanding. Um, and that uh, for which, of course, psychology is, uh, the study of psychology is uh, responsible. And that these have added enormously to self-understanding um, so that we now should, if this were true, understand or have an increased knowledge of the difficult questions of what is good, how to live, the purpose of existence, and so forth. And I, this morning, actually, I opened the first book at random, and it was truly at random, and I arrived on page 83. So what did I find on page 83? Clarity is what a person's psychology is always endeavoring to return to. Innate clarity and resilience are always a shining beacon, even when a person seems helplessly lost. You see, and here the uh, writer adds emphasis, puts it in italics, Clarity isn't an achievement, it's a pre-existing condition. It's not something you need to practice or work on. And it's, a, it's an expression of who you really are. Well, I hope this is all now clear to you and that you will find it useful. <laughs> or at least that part of you uh, that is the real you. I opened the second book again at random, and uh, what did I read? I found acceptance means understanding that things are or are not happening. <laughs> uh, mindfulness ex uh, involves accepting what's happened and what's happening right now. It involves feeling what you're feeling, without trying to resist or control those feelings to whatever it is, whatever is happening. I presume that they've missed out what isn't happening as well, because one has very strong feelings about what isn't happening, actually. Now, um, I try to imagine, I try quite hard, actually, to imagine what it is like to find this kind of drivel illuminating. <laughs> Uh, but although I've been uh, studying human beings for a long time, I just can't imagine what it's like to find it illuminating. And one of my many ideas of hell is having to wade through hundreds of pages of this stuff, though there are hundreds, perhaps millions of pages of uh, this stuff published and printed and presumably bought. It was claimed that these two books were bestsellers. And if you listen to people talking uh, on buses uh, about themselves, you can hear this kind of talk uh, constantly, uh, usually with a little uh, neurochemistry thrown in so that uh, uh, you know, they don't have enough serotonin or they have too much serotonin or the lithium level's too high or too low or something like that. Now, one might have thought that uh, if psychology had illuminated human existence, some rumor of its findings uh, would have reached the population at large. Uh, but I think the existence of these books suggests otherwise. Uh, and in other words, I think that really in our self-understanding, we haven't advanced much beyond Norman Vincent Peale or Napoleon Hill, let alone Shakespeare. Well, let me now briefly contrast all this with uh, Dr. Johnson, though I could, of course, have picked out uh, many other great writers, almost any great writer, in fact. Uh, Johnson, uh, but Johnson is uh, peculiarly apt to remark on what no man would have thought and now appears scarcely possible for any man to miss. And he said this of somebody else. Uh, he wasn't praising himself. In one of his brief essays, for example, Johnson discusses 
what would now be called a social phobia and, of course, would be treated with drugs. No cause more frequent, uh, no cause, uh, nothing, sorry, he said, more uh, frequently causes bashfulness, said Dr. Johnson, than too high an opinion of our own importance. And he doesn't say that it's so in every case, and he doesn't even say that bashfulness is always and everywhere undesirable, because, of course, shyness can be um, a desirable quality as well as an undesirable one. And when I look back on my own shyness, I was very shy as a child and adolescent. Um, I knew that, uh, I know that there was, uh, there is at least an element of truth in what Dr. Johnson says, in my case at any rate, because I'm afraid to have to confess that even when I was blushing, I never had the slightest uh, doubt about my own importance. <laughs> Well, he continues, Dr. Johnson, he continues, the bashful person considers what he should say or do will never be forgotten, and that renown or infamy are suspended upon every syllable, and that nothing ought to fall from him which will not bear the test of time. And he concludes, he that considers how little he dwells on the condition of others will learn how little the attention of others is attracted to by himself. The utmost which we can reasonably hope for is to fill a vacant hour with prattle and be forgotten. Now, this isn't pessimistic. It's both realistic and consolatory, and over and over again calls our attention to the, uh, Dr. Johnson over and over again calls our attention to the subtle and complex relationships between states of mind and morality. Johnson says things that are obvious and yet we have never thought of, and by doing so enables us, even if he doesn't compel us, to control ourselves. For example, he says that, as cruelty looks upon misery without partaking pain, so envy beholds increase of happiness without partaking joy. And I don't need to tell you, I'm sure, what part envy plays in the world, uh, but Johnson is not so naive as to suppose that by a simple enunciation of this reality, I don't know whether that is so, what Dr. Johnson said was so obvious to you that you had all thought it all the time, but I certainly hadn't until I, I read it. He's not so naive as to su suppose that by saying this, the vice itself will just be eliminated. In another context, he says, Nothing is more unjust, however common, than to charge with hypocrisy him that expresses zeal for those virtues which he neglects to practice, since he may be sincerely convinced of the advantages of conquering his passions without yet having obtained the victory. But a clear enunciation of envy, what it means, what it is to be envious, may help you, if not to conquer it, at least to control it. Johnson says nothing, and I, 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 I must stop, but I could give many illustrations of Johnson's thinking, says nothing that any mind could not have thought of for itself, uh, and even if it has not actually thought of it. But everything he says has an immediate and obvious application to our own lives. On another occasion, he says again what is obviously true, a student may easily exhaust his life in comparing divines and moralists without any practical regard to morality or religion. He may be learning not to live, but to reason. And nowadays, if, I think if he had been alive today, he would have added psychology uh, or psychologists to that list. Uh, psychology does not and cannot tell us how to live even when we have no idea of how to live already. Indeed, it serves as an obstacle to living well, as it prevents honest reflection of the Johnsonian kind. It is, as Karl Krauss said of psychoanalysis, the disease it pretends to cure. And that, at any rate, is the drift of my very short book, or perhaps I should call it a tract. Thank you very much.
I just uh, wait for the microphone for any questions. Um, let me uh, start, Tony, just asking a question about uh, the, the influence of uh, psychology on criminal justice, an area where, you, where you've worked. Um, it, it seems that the criminal justice system is based on the idea of personal responsibility, but the, the thrust of psychology, as you're describing it, is undermining that. Uh, could you... Yes, I, I, well, I have many cases uh, uh, in which I could uh, uh, describe the effect of, of uh, psychologists on trials because, of course, um, I, having read many psychological reports, I can uh, assure you that if you were to kill the person uh, next to you, you would find a psychologist to say that you were in some way abnormal. Uh, and the idea of abnormality in itself being some kind of exculpation uh, uh, exists in court because if it didn't exist there wouldn't be any point in calling the person as a witness in the first place and the fact is that I'm afraid uh, psychology is treated with superstitious awe uh, by at least British judges I don't know about American judges uh, you know it's, it's treated with more awe than miracle uh, working virgins uh, by peasants in uh, Central America um, I remember a case, for example, uh, in which a woman had, this was a civil case, not a, uh, but the effect on civil case is probably, uh, civil law is probably even worse than on, uh, on uh, criminal law. Uh, a woman claimed to have been exposed to carbon monoxide, and, and she had been exposed to carbon monoxide, and she actually looked up what she was supposed to have suffered, and did duly suffer from it, and this was proved in court. And one of the effects, the alleged effects, was that she, um, she couldn't concentrate and therefore couldn't get a job. And of course, her career had just been about to take off uh, when she was exposed to carbon monoxide. And she underwent the most ferocious cross-examination for two days that I have ever seen. And she never lost her concentration. Uh, <laughs> during this uh, cross-examination, and she'd mastered literally thousands of pages of documents. But nevertheless, uh, the uh, she had, a, had a, a, a psychologist report saying that she could not concentrate. And instead of believing what he had seen in front of his face, the judge believed uh, what the psychologist said. Um, so uh, that's a, a kind of uh, situation that arises, in my experience, pretty often in courts, and it's disastrous, because, of course, anybody can fake almost anything. All right. Back of the room. Hi. <clears throat> Did you feel that in your work in the prison that there were times when you provided aha moments or aha moments came up in your discussions with the people you were dealing with? Uh, yes, quite and, often, quite often, yes. And did that make a difference to them in their lives, do you think? Well, people, if I said yes, people would say, what is your evidence that it did? And I wouldn't be able to provide a firm evidence. But certainly, aha moments uh, did occur. Um, the... Uh, uh, and they were sort of as a result of sub-Socratic dialogue, as it were. So that, for example, I remember one prisoner, he, he was a, a, a burglar and he was caught many, many times and was in prison and let out and he came back and did it all again. I mean, he must have wanted, with the British police as they are, he must have wanted to be caught because that's the only way uh, he could ever have been caught. Anyhow, um, uh, he said, uh, Doctor, uh, um, uh, why uh, do you think my uh, childhood has got something to do with my, uh, the fact that I keep burgling? I said, no, absolutely nothing whatever. And he said, well, what is it then? I said, well, you're lazy and stupid, and, um, <laughs> and you want things that you're not prepared to work for. And he laughed. He didn't grow angry at all. So he knew that the kind of um, 
uh, I don't know, condolence I was supposed to offer him for his undoubtedly terrible childhood, because they do have terrible childhoods, um, most criminals, that is undoubtedly true. It enabled us then to talk in an honest fashion. Whereas if I just said, yes, I think, you know, your childhood is absolutely terrible, and, and I think uh, there's a direct consequence of your, as a direct consequence of your, your childhood, you break into people's houses. If I'd said anything approaching that, uh, we would never have been able to uh, have an honest conversation. But I can't tell you uh, that he, uh, that it had a great effect on him. Because actually, as it happens, most burglars uh, stop burgling spontaneously at the age of, uh, by the age of 39. Over here. Thank you, Deroy Murdoch with the Atlas Network. Uh, based on your experience, did you say, say that all criminals are made or any of them born? Uh, um, what you can say probably is that people have a propensity, either strong or weak, towards uh, towards criminality, and it can be, uh, if you like, if you look at it as a normal distribution curve, that curve can be changed by social circumstances to the right or to the left. There are a few people, but they are pretty few, who have, who give you the feeling that whatever, whatever, wherever they lived, however, whatever had been done, uh, they would have turned out extremely badly. And they're, of course, a very chilling uh, group of people. But they are not very many by comparison with the total number of criminals. But they, I think they exist. Back here, back of the room. Just wait. Thank you for your thought-provoking um, talk. Um, I am a practicing psychologist, just to be uh, honest and open. Um, and I liked your, interpret your Johnsonian interpretation of we can't perhaps get our clients or patients to conquer whatever it is, but to control it. And that's exactly what CBT does. So I was just curious as to why you didn't mention in your talk a cognitive behavioral therapy. Well, I'm not, it's not that I'm against uh, cognitive behavioral therapy as such for specific uh, little problems. What I'm against is the extension of psychology to explain the entire range of human existence. And there is a tendency, certainly in England, uh, to treat life as if it were an extended case of arachnophobia. And, uh, and that's what I'm against. I, I, if someone came with arachnophobia, I wouldn't deny them uh, some kind of therapy. But we can't treat the whole of life uh, as if it were that. And I think there is a tendency to do, to give the impression that for every human problem, there is a kind of technical solution, which is either psychological or pharmacological or surgical or whatever. And I think that is actually a very harmful idea to impart to a population. Uh, yes, here in the middle of the room. We haven't had one from the middle. I wonder if you could offer us any quick solutions to this problem of uh, making excuses. Um, uh, no, but I probably have a good excuse for that. <laughs> no, I think we just have to accept that this, uh, uh, there is no quick solution to this because we all want excuses. I mean, the first thing one does when one does something wrong, I mean, maybe there's no one in this room who's never done anything wrong, I don't know. But the first thing you do is make excuses for yourself, and we are brilliantly, uh, so there's a human tendency to do it anyway, and you can either encourage it, I suppose, in a culture, or discourage it. Um, and of course, yeah, you have to be careful, because of course there are mitigating circumstances to things, so you, you can't just say there are no under any circumstances, uh, uh, is there mitigation? I mean, that would be very cruel. Uh, 
uh, so it's all a question of judgment and, and so on. It's not, it, it, I don't think, there's no technical solution to the problem of man always seeking excuses. Start uh, back and then move forward. Bob Weisberg. Uh, you seem to be having two parallel themes here in your taking apart modern psychology. One, you're taking apart modern psychology as it currently exists, or at least what you find in the airport. Uh, the second is a deeper issue, and that is whether these matters can be addressed scientifically. Uh, and it yeah. seems to me that it's easy to confuse bad science with science. And particularly, I find, uh, I, I share some of your views on psychology, but I find very enlightening reading some of Steven Pinker's books. And he, he finds himself as a cognitive scientist. So the question really is, can it get any better? And if it cannot get any better, do you think it's simply beyond science to master these difficult questions? Or the people who are doing it right now are incompetent and not able to do it? Uh, it's a very good question. And I think, though I'm not a philosopher, that there are metaphysical reasons why uh, the whole of human life will never be explicable. Uh, let me give you an example of a book uh, that I read recently. It was by a man called Baron Cohen, who, yeah, uh, about evil. Did you read the book? Uh, you, I'm, talking, I'm talking about the scientists, not the, not the, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, in this book, he says that uh, that evil, we should abandon the term evil uh, because all it is is a neuro, if I've understood him correctly, it's a neurological uh, condition which involves lack of empathy. And what he uh, does is he puts various terrible people in uh, very powerful machines and some bits of their brain uh, don't light up as they should, and some do, and all that kind of thing. But the problem is, for this, is that the judgment that these people do wrong cannot be shown on that kind of instrument. So in other words, your idea of what is right or wrong, or good or bad, precedes the investigation. So the investigation will never actually show that. So I think, but I might be wrong, uh, that there will always remain an unsolvable mystery about, uh, about ourselves. And for that, I'm rather glad, actually. I wouldn't really want a world in which I could have some kind of scanner. I point it at you and know what you're thinking. I don't think I'd like a world like that. So I'm, I, I think there are reasons for thinking we won't exp And after all, in spite of the enormous claims of greater understanding. When we go out into the street, do we feel that there's any greater understanding? I don't think so. So I, I, do, I am a, a metaphysically skeptical, although, of course, particular problems can be solved by, by, by science. I was uh, reading an article recently that there's been a great decline in talk therapy in this country anyway, and it's been replaced, the article speculated, both by uh, the use of drugs and also by um, phone apps to help improve yourself. And I was wondering uh, what you thought of this development. Um, well, I, I ended, of course, by saying that psychoanalysis is the disease that it... Uh, that it claims to cure. So the idea that there is a solution to the ordinary problems of human existence is itself part of the problem. With regard to drugs, I think the evidence is pretty strong that they have been disgracefully overprescribed uh, by uh, doctors under various kinds of pressures, which include uh, salesmanship, uh, bogus science, or not bogus science, but incomplete science, and also the pressure of patients themselves. So that all these things, and people after all, do want a nice easy solution. Now the problem with giving to their, to their various problems, the problem, one of the problems with drugs is that once the doctor starts prescribing drugs for someone, it is a natural conclusion of the person for whom he has prescribed them that he is ill. 
Now, fortunately, for, uh, and, and it's a very quick way of getting the patient out of the, uh, out of the office, uh, and the patient is very pleased because now the patient has the solution. And luckily for the doctor, there are hundreds of different things he can try. So that this pas de deux can go on for years, actually, literally years, before someone says, the doctor says, I don't think there's anything wrong with you. <laughs> and, uh, which must be the case, because he can't, he can't cure it. And, uh, <clears throat> and then the patient very naturally asks, well, why have you been prescribing me these drugs all these years? Uh, to which the doctor finds it difficult to give an answer. Uh, how you control it, I, I don't know. But in this country, certainly, there's an enormous scandal. I mean, it doesn't relate, well, it's, well, I suppose it's psychology or psychological conditions. There's an enormous scandal about the opioids that have been prescribed and have, have killed more than 100,000 people since the turn of the century. And the, without any, in my view, without any proper uh, medical reasons for the prescription of these drugs in the first place, in the majority of cases. Um, and this is a mixture of commercialization, uh, doctors be actually being afraid of their patients, and, um, and of course, pressure of, of patients. Um, so, but again, I don't have any quick solution to all this. So in addition to psychology, it seems to me that the world of political correctness is also taking responsibility away. I mean, we don't blame people for what they do. We come up with excuses uh, for various kinds of, well, we were at the 9-11 at the museum, and if, if you go through that museum, it's almost like the planes flew in without, uh, without any real The planes flew in, you know. <laughs> Yes, well, of course, there is that tendency, and it's not only psychology, but sociology and so on, because there is a tendency, I mean, I, I don't want to sound psychological, but if there is a statistical uh, correlation between one thing and another, it is almost always assumed that it is a, a causative one. Yeah, and, and it's very difficult, I mean, it's very difficult to get rid of that impression. So if someone tells you that 98% of people who do X have something, then you automatically assume that it is the X that has caused them to do it. So that, uh, uh, I think, uh, if I remember rightly, I once wrote a, an article in which I suggested that one of the principal causes of criminology, uh, of crime, was criminology. <laughs> and this was only half uh, facetious, because uh, they don't so much explain as explain away. And um, so there is a tendency. Uh, yes, I agree with you. Any more questions? Oh, one back here, yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, the knife went in. Um, I don't want to one-up the British locution, but on this side of the pond, we had an infamous case in, I think, about 20 years ago um, with... Um, at the tennis match when in the New York subway um, when the guy was killed, he said he fell on my knife. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that one. But um, my question, and maybe it was partially answered already, but um, the people who say this, he fell on my knife, are there a few people who actually believe that's what happened? I mean, the rest of us look at them and say, oh, he's lying, that's terrible, but do they actually believe that that's the truth? Well, the human mind is a very complex instrument. And it depends who they're talking to, uh, uh, whether they believe it or not. Uh, and you see this with drug addicts. Uh, what they say and how they account for themselves differs, com uh, differs very much uh, depending on uh, whom they're addressing. So that a drug addict will describe the horrors of not having the drug uh, to the doctor from whom he hopes to receive a prescription. And 
amongst themselves, they'll be telling you where you can get the best drug and how cheap it is and so on and so forth. And it isn't necessarily that they're lying on um, one or other occasion. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you must know, or at least I know, I mean, I, I assume that I'm not a monster in this regard, that one is sometimes very vehement in denying what one knows to be true. And in a certain sense, one believes it, but at the same time, there's a still small voice saying that it's not it's not actually true. And unfortunately, in many circumstances, there are people who are encouraged to, to tell what is not true because they derive some advantage from it. And eventually, if you repeat something long enough, it, it becomes true in your mind. So I think it's more simple and more complex than just they're lying or they're telling the truth. Um, I'm sorry to sound psychological, but, <laughs> but that, I think, is the truth of it. Okay. One more question. Having spent a certain portion of my life uh, as part of a major drug company, I take a certain backward step because what you said in the previous answer to the question struck me as an all-out attack on the money-grubbing, pushy pharmaceutical industry who do anything to make an extra buck. Hmm. So knowing that I know you're not doing that because I have read everything that you've ever done in our wonderful journal, I consider you at the reason I'm here, because I consider you one of the men among men of, of thought. I, I do have this question. There are people, for whatever the reasons are, who become angry. They become angry sometimes at life, sometimes at individuals, sometimes at the way the hand has been dealt to them. And sometimes that anger takes the form of action which if they were not angry, they would probably never think of doing, but for some reason, maybe it's because they saw their father do it, or an older uncle, or whatever. There's something that works inside their head. And if they are not given something to mollify and, and, and quiet down that feeling, they can do bad things. They can, they can punch their wife in the face. They can take a their next door neighbor and do bad things. But if they take a drug that has specifically been tested to reduce that form of rage, to lower that feeling of hostility, and they find that when they take that drug, life is very normal. They don't have those feelings. They don't have the depression and all the rest of it, then what in the name of Tom, Tom Hill, or whoever that is, what in any reason is that not a desirable thing for a society such as ours or for use wherever that condition exists? Well, the question is whether such things actually exist. And um, <clears throat> I would agree that if they existed and there were no harmful effects and all the rest of it, of course, then I would be all in favor of SOMA and so forth. But I don't think they actually exist. And one of the examples is Andreas Lubitz. Andreas Lubitz was precisely the kind, you, you know, the pilot who, who flew uh, German wings into the, uh, into the Alps. Now, in my opinion, he was angry rather than depressed. And I can't say, I, I have a suspicion of what he was angry about. I think he was probably angry at his girlfriend. And he probably wanted to punish her. I, ha I can't prove that. In fact, it's, it, it's not probably provable. Uh, but from the little that I've read, that seemed to be his kind of personality. Anyway, he was angry. He was not depressed. And of course, he had all kinds of treatment for years, it, certain, it turns out. Uh, but it didn't actually alter him. Now, one of the questions is whether 
people like Andreas Lubitz are now more common than they once were. I mean, they've always been angry, disturbed people, and there always will be. But the, and I can't answer this question scientifically, but it seems to me one interesting question is whether types like Andreas Lubitz um, are more common. And if they are more common, or what is the kind of culture that makes such people common? And a culture in which people are constantly um, referring to what is due them is a culture in which people will become angry. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that without that culture, Andreas Lubitz would have been a nice chap or anything like that. Uh, but it seems to me that that's much more likely to, uh, uh, to be important than uh, giving someone like him drugs. And incidentally, the drugs that he wa uh, wa uh, was given, the drugs he was, uh, that he, well, he was prescribed them, whether he took them, I don't think we know. That's always a, a uh, difficult question. But the drugs that he was uh, prescribed have been associated with outbreaks of rage. So I, again, uh, the scientific evidence is very difficult to, to, to evaluate because people like uh, Lubitz are actually pretty rare, thank goodness. But uh, uh, the idea that there, is, that there are drugs which have only beneficial effects, especially when prescribed in huge quantities, is, I think, uh, fundamentally mistaken. All right, we're out of time. I want to thank you all for coming, and thank you, Tony Daniels, for the illuminating talk. Thank you very much. Uh, the book is available at the back of the room if uh, you, you would like to purchase a copy. Thank you again.